Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's just get right into the Word. I know that Jesus is the Word. God bless the Word. Hallelujah. Lord, we just thank you for the Word. We thank you that our eyes are open tonight to receive what you have prepared for us for such a time as this. I pray that the greater understanding be given to those who are here tonight with a deeper revelation. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for protecting us and showing us the way. In the name of Jesus, I cover us with the blood of the Lamb of God. And I thank you, Lord, for angels that camped about us in Jesus' name. Amen. Title of message, Why Am I Being Persecuted? Ooh, hallelujah. Why are you being persecuted? Well, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, you can put it on the outline. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12 says, Yes, all who desire to live godly, that means also to walk godly. Guess what will happen? Those who walk in Christ Jesus, it says, will suffer persecution. Let's look at our Bibles in Matthew chapter 13. Well, what is persecution? Why am I being persecuted? Why is things happening to me? I'm just trying to be a nice guy. I'm trying to be a nice girl. Garrett, Brother Garrett, will you take those keys for me, please, and see if you can open up the uh, children's ministry? One of those keys on there, open it up. Thank you, sir. So why are, we being, why are we being persecuted? Matthew chapter 13, verse 19. Hallelujah. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who receives seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed on the stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Matthew chapter 13, verse 21. Yet he who has no root in himself endures only for a while, but when tribulation and persecution comes. So what happens when we get persecuted? Well, we, a lot of times we begin to lose our courage. We begin to lose our faith. We begin to lose our strength. Why? Because of the word, it says, immediately he stumbles. So well, for a while, when tribulation and persecution arises, because of the word, he immediately stumbles. Verse 22, but he received the seed among the thorns, as he hears the word and the cares of this world. In other words, we care a lot about other things, and that's why a lot of times we're being persecuted, because we're taking our eyes off the things God wants us to see. Come on, help me. Amen. So if you're being persecuted, why are you being persecuted? Because you're a good person? Well, you know, actually sometimes, you know, had this happened to me a while back, and yeah, it happened to me. I was at a, a place of business, I've been going in there for a while, and the lady says to me, she goes, you know what? She says, every time you come in here, you complain. I was like, whoa, I never really knew that. Maybe I have been. You know, because a lot of times we, even as Christians, we think everything ought to be kind of, you know, perfect because we're so good to others and we want to be loved. I'm just trying to be nice. But maybe she's seen something in me. Right. Come on now, help me. Yep. Maybe there was some uh, pride or some type of thing. You know, maybe I'm thinking I'm better than someone else. Ah, I couldn't be. But why was I persecuted? I thought I was being a good person, maybe even talking about Jesus. But sometimes we don't understand the things and the way we act and act. We can be persecuted because we're not all that we think we are. <clears throat> Just a thought. So in this case here, they're, they're being persecuted. Are you a person being persecuted because you've got so many cares in the world? Or are you being persecuted because you are holy? Amen? Let's look at our thought down here. When looking in the life of Jesus, we see that there were people who gossiped about him, lied about him, rejected him, and even tried to destroy him. That was Jesus. I can't think but a bunch of other great men and women of God in the Bible who went through things. Uh, Paul, for instance. You know, Paul, the Bible says that he had a thorn in the flesh. People like to say that all kinds of different angles. But actually, that, that thorn in the flesh was because Paul was being persecuted by people, and he didn't like it. So he come to God, and he said, Lord, take these people away from me who are always attacking me. And God said, no, my grace is sufficient. Come on. So if you're being persecuted, you've been lied about, you've been talked about, you've been, you've been taken at advantage, could it be that it's because uh, the enemy's trying to get you? Yeah, if you're trying to live a godly life. But if not, 
But don't use that example. Maybe some things we need to work on. Maybe it could be our love walk. Maybe we're judging people, finding fault in people because we're the Christians. Come on. The more Christians, the only people who really judge people are Christians. If we set this high standard, I was, I was talking to uh, Brother Jude about that earlier and talking about, you know, we, we, we got this standard in our mind we think people, people ought to be. When God doesn't see like we see, He looks at the, the heart. Amen? Let's look at this next thought. We might be taking a lot of heat right now from our families and friends and people who really don't like us, but we should never let what they don't see in us define who's in us. Let me say that again. You might be taking a lot of heat right now from family and friends and people who really don't like you. Come on. But we should never let what they don't see in us define who's really in us and who's really in us. Come on, Christians. Amen. Come on, Amen. children of God. Amen. Who's in you? Amen. If you're born again and you, and you accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Bible says there's a greater one in you. The greater one. 1 John 4, 4. 1 John 4, 4 says, greater one is in you, in other words, than all the evil that's in the world. Greater one is in you. Who's the greater one? Christ in you, the Bible says. There's actually a person in you, the person of Christ. The Holy Spirit is in you. When you got born again and you received, you received the kingdom of God came and lived in you, in the Spirit of God. Amen? Look at this next time. See, no matter how much evil they do to us, we should never change our good. In other words, don't use what they're doing to us to go act in some way to sin. Amen. <laughs> you know, and let's be honest. Have you ever wanted to get somebody back for what they did to you? Come on. Don't, don't get all holy with me now. Well, I would never do that. God would never do that. Yeah, right. Or how about this? Have you ever prayed for somebody to, you know, to, to, uh, God to get them back? Or in other words, for God to remove them out of your life because they're giving you a hard time? Oh, nobody here either. <laughs> and we, we've probably all done that. But is that the right way of living? According to the standards of the kingdom of God? No, not at all. No matter how much evil they do to us, we should never allow change to do good. We overcome evil with good. Let's look at this. Romans chapter 12, verse 21. The Bible says, do not be overcome. In other words, don't be overcome with evil. But, overcome evil with good. Well, Pastor, you don't know what they've been doing to me. They're mean people. Well, is it really them, or is the enemy working behind that? See, if you really know how the kingdom of God is, and you really know uh, what the, the oracles of God is, and how the kingdom works, and how the devil works, uh, we'll quit blaming people. Uh, even sometimes we just quit blaming uh, the devil because it's really us. We need to express love. Love is an adhesive that, that drives away evil. Come on, did you ever try to love somebody that just hates you? That's hard. And you know they hate you. The way they look at you, the way they stab you in the back, come on, the way they persecute you, lie about you. You think they really like you? Well, guess what? They're a perfect candidate to get saved. Perfect candidate for you to express, I to express the love of God that sheds abroad in our heart. And they're jealous because you get so much peace, even during your times of trials and during times of persecution, even during times that you're, that you're going through something, you keep the same attitude of patience looking at God as your source, as God as the one who's going to bring you out as he's always done before, and they don't like that. Because they want you to taste what they've been tasting. Most of the time it's fear, worry, unloving. They could even go through some sicknesses. That's a tough place to be if you never lived there. It's hard. But I'm here to tell you there's one who lifts you up a higher level. His name is Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's look at our next thought. Uh, Romans 12, 9. Look at Romans 12, 9. Talking about overcoming evil with good. Let love without hypocrisy detest what is evil. Cling to what is, everybody say it? Good. Good, or who's good? See, I cling to Jesus. He's the only good one. <laughs> Why do you call me good? <laughs> Amen? 
Verse 10, be kindly affectionate to one another, with brotherly love and honor, give preference to one another, not lacking in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, we can say persecution, continue steadfast in prayer. So we stay in prayer. Why? Because we know prayer is an answer a lot of times, not only to our situation, but when we pray for others. When we lay our lives down for that person that might be coming against us, uh, we begin to get a, a lifting. We begin to get peace because God says, you know what? I chose you for such a time. Why does God allow us to be around people who are, uh, you know, already in trouble, people who are already uh, having a tough time, people who are attacking other people? How come we get to see that? Do you ever think about that? Why do you get to see that? Why do you have to feel their anger? They could, why am I there? Well, maybe it's a call to divine appointment. Maybe you might be the only person who's going to pray for them in your secret place. God rewards those who pray for their enemies. So why am I being persecuted? Look at this next thought. Jesus never found one good reason why people who came against him should get what's coming to them. Come on now. DJ, you're going to get what's coming to you. You ever tell somebody, not you, but you like to tell somebody, oh, they got a special place in hell for that person. You ever heard somebody say that? Yeah. Yeah, they got a special place in hell for them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the truth is, God's already set them free if they would just come. They don't have to go to hell. But we, we like to think they're going to get what they're coming to them. Amen? Let's look at this. Ephesians 4.27. Ephesians 4.27. Jesus never found one good reason why people who came against him should get what's coming to them. Ephesians 4.27. Give no place to the devil. So that means that that place I actually owned, that I have authority over that place, but if I want to give it to the devil, I can't. Give no place. In other words, I have it first. It belongs to me. Why am I giving my heart, my mind, my words, my eyes to the devil? You see what I'm saying? The devil can't do anything to us but what we allow him. If we give him a place in our mind, if we give him a place in our heart, if we give him a place in our eyes and our body, then what we've done is, is, here, devil, you can have control now. So the scripture says, give no place for the devil. Look at verse 26. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. Be angry, do not sin. So it's all right to get angry. Now, what's he talking about being angry? Not being angry at the people persecute us, but it's all right to be angry at the devil. But don't sin. Don't, don't, don't quit being angry at the devil just because you got peace. No, you hate that devil. You hate what he's doing to other people. You still got to go and help people. You still got to pray for people. You still got to love them. Amen? Let's look at your next thought on your outline. Matthew chapter 5, verse 38. Talk about why are we being persecuted? Matthew chapter 5, verse 38. You have heard what it said, an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, not to resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you in the right cheek, turn the other cheek. I don't know. If, if, if somebody was to slap me in the right cheek, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't think I could, I don't think I'd turn them. See, I just won't be honest here. Me and the devil will be fighting. Come on. But God gave us a pattern now. So that means all things are possible. Right? With God. All right. Verse 40, but if anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. Whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him and ask you, and from he who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. Verse 43, Matthew chapter 5, verse 43, you have heard it said, you have heard that what it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Well, see, that's, that's the old standard. That's what the people say, you know, hate your enemy, right? That's what they said. But Jesus said, this is what I said. It's, it's just amazing what, what God says to do and what we think we ought to do. 
And the scripture tells us not to do that. But I say to you, so God's telling us tonight, if you're angry, don't be angry at the person. It's all right to be angry at the devil. All right? You know, the world says, you know, if you need, if you need money, give another job. But I say to you, give, and it shall be given. Come on, press down, shake, get up, flow. Actually, in the scriptures, over 13 times, Jesus refers to saying, but I say to you. Just in the book of Matthew, but I say to you. But I say to you. I think he's trying to get a point across. Anytime you repeat yourself, but I say to you, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. I say to you, give to those who ask. I say to you, forgive those who persecute you. Forgive those who use you and abuse you. Well, it's tough. That's why you got to know Jesus. That's why you got to know what God has to say about the matter. Then you got to focus on those things and what he says and who's in you and your identity. And don't let the devil ever steal who you are in Jesus. That's how we forget because those cares of the world steal our faith sometimes and steal your identity if you let it. Let's go on the outline. This is simply saying that we are not to take matters into our own hands and defend ourselves. Vengeance is mine. I repay them, saith the Lord. That's in Romans chapter 12, verse 19. Striving to vindicate self actually shows a lack of faith in God. Oh, Jude, can you put some music on for us, please? Who always keeps his promise. How many know that God always keeps his promise even when we don't? Amen. Amen. Titus 1-2, we're not going to go there for time's sake. It says God cannot lie. So if God can't lie, then that means there's a promise right there that's been sealed by God. If God is a liar, then nobody went to heaven. And nobody's gone. I refuse to believe that. I have friends and family I know are in heaven. Do you? I just know they're there. And there's another confirmation. I know I'm going. Yeah. If, if God chooses to go. And you say, well, Pastor, you sound pretty cocky there. I say, no, I know who I believe. I've done this persuaded a long time ago that he is more than able to keep me because I've committed my life to him. I'm not talking about just being a Christian. I'm talking about being Christ-like. Now, I'm working on certain areas to give revelation a greater understanding of who I am. Not that I'm a, a baby Christian. No, no. There's no babies in Christ. You're not a baby. You got everything you needed when you got born again. You didn't get a baby Jesus. But what we're doing is taking this, this young this naive training and getting our minds renewed with truth. And that truth will set you free. free. Who wants to be free tonight? Well, if you don't want to be free, whoo! Hallelujah. Boy, just take a deep breath. Go ahead, one more. Real deep. Wow. Taste and see how good the Lord is. See, the presence of God is here. Even though there's only 10,000 of us here tonight, Amen. there's still room for 10,000 more. That's right. Come on. That's right. Right? Because where there's one, there's God, right? One or two, he's in the midst. And, and you brought him in with you, so there's a bunch of Jesus sitting in the house. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Signs and wonders and miracles follow the word. How many here came for signs and wonders and miracles now? How many here need a breakthrough? Come on. Amen. How many who actually look at Well, guess what? Tonight's the night. When you leave, you'll never be the same. It's because of the words that's been spoken. Not because it's a great preacher up here or there's people who just love you. No, because God's Word is power. Right. Amen, God's Word. You don't believe me? Take these outlines, take them home this week and study them. Look in your Bible and see if they say the same thing. If they don't, you're probably not reading. Amen? Let's go on to our next thought here. Striving to vindicate self actually shows a lack of faith in God who always keeps His promise. Hebrews 6.18, let's go there though. Hebrews 6.18, talking about how God's not a liar, how he cannot lie. That was Titus 1. Hebrews 6.18, probably got this underlined. That by two unchangeable things, immutable things, in which it's impossible for God to lie. It's impossible for God to... What do you mean? I thought all things were possible with God. Well, one thing's not possible for him to lie. Right. He would never lie against himself. He made an oath, because there was nobody greater than him. He made a promise to himself that he would never lie. Amen? Amen. So we need to look at that as true. That is the top, that's one of the top things that I look at God. God, if you said this, I'm going to believe it, whether I feel it, whether I see it, 
whether I believe it, I'm hoping to believe it, and you don't have to prove yourself, God. I'm going to start with what the Word says about you. Then as I take that, literally, that, that truth begins to deposit from my mouth into my heart and back up to my mind. And next thing you know, I'm walking. I'm walking as an epistle of love. And then I'm going to get persecuted. <laughs> you can't offend me. I'm a dead man walking. But I'm born again. See? I'm born again. Oh, no man, nothing now. But to love him. You see, it's perfect love that casts out fear. When we let people get to us, we let people uh, use us, we let all this stuff, it's usually when we react because we're in some type of fear. We're the ones. Now, we already know they are. But we're the ones who's afraid. They're going to take something from me. They're going to use me. Don't they know who I am? Well, who are you? We've been bought by the blood of Jesus. We don't even own ourselves. Amen? Let's keep going. Last thought at the bottom there. Uh, it also indicates spiritual weakness. We talk about when we try to protect ourselves or when we try to, to persecute others for being persecuted. That's a form of weakness which only is looking at the present moment instead of seeing things in eternity. See, does God sees the whole picture at the same time. Do we see the whole picture at the same time? I tell people all the time, you know, if they're going through something with their family members, you got to look at your baby as already grown up. Amen. Come on. you got to look at them already prospering all their lives. They're going to be in good health. They're going to have perfect uh, marriages. They're going to have all the things they need. And then you got to start speaking to them while they're young. Thank you. I think that you never smoke, babe. I think you never drink, you never cuss, you never, you never run around. Oh, you're just such a good baby. You start planting seed early. Right? Because right? words are the most powerful force in this world. And usually we're being persecuted by words. Come on. We're being persecuted by words. We heard what somebody had to say behind our back. Or oh, they might even say it to our face. And we know they're conniving. They know they're trying to brew up some stuff against other people. They're in a crowd talking about us in another room and another building. They're using words on us. Right? right? That's what the devil uses. He uses words. Why was Jesus persecuted? Because of the words that he said. Yeah. Well, let's hope you got that one. Is it because of the word that you're being persecuted? By your words you'll be condemned. By your words you'll be justified. Choose this day who you're going to serve. Amen? Why well, sure Miss Lynn? Where are they at? He must be out there spreading the gospel. Amen? Amen. Look at this next thought here. One of the best examples of persecution of Corpus is David. Let's look at this. 1 Samuel 24. 1 Samuel. Let's go to your Bible. 1 Samuel 24. And we all know the life of King David. Well, here's a guy who's been all the way around. Let's say 1 Samuel 24. Let's look at verse 1. Now it happened when Saul had returned from following the Philistines. That he was that it was told him, saying, Take note, David's in the wilderness. And Saul took three thousand chosen men of Israel and went to seek David and his men on the rocks. So he came to the sheepfolds of the road, and there was a cave, and Saul went in and attended to his needs. David and his men were staying in the, in another cave. Then the men of David said to him, This is the day which the Lord told you. Hey David, behold, he's going to give you your enemies in your hand, that you may do to him as seemed good to you. So David arose and secretly went in and cut off the corner of Saul's robe. Now it happened after David's heart was told because he had cut Saul's robe. And he said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should even do this thing to my master, the Lord's anointed. He stretched out his hand against him, seeing that he was anointed of the Lord. Verse 7, So David restrained his servants with these words and did not allow them to rise against Saul. And Saul went up from the cave and went on his way. And David arose afterwards, went out of the cave, and called out to Saul, saying, My Lord, the king. And Saul looked behind him. David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed down. And David, Saul said, David said to Saul, Why do you listen to the words of those men who say, Indeed, David seeks you harm? See, there's mis misunderstanding here. 
Saul thought that David leaned him on. Verse 10, somebody thinking about you like that? Somebody misunderstanding what you've done or what you've said? Trying to hold you accountable for something that wasn't really said or done? Verse 10, now look at this. Now look, this day your eyes seen the Lord deliver you today into my hand in this cave. And someone urged me to kill you, but my eyes spared you, I said. And I did not stretch out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Moreover, my father sees, sees the corner of your robe in your hand. For in it I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you. He's telling him, say, look, oh, I had a chance to get you. Matter of fact, I was there and you didn't even know I was there. I got gotcha. you. I could have taken you down. Come on, I could take her down. I, I know how to bring her down. I got some info on her. I know how to, I, know, I could tell somebody about her and it would ruin her life. I could take her down. So David said, but literally David could have killed him. He had him right where he wanted him. And all we know that, that the king was only after David to kill him. Had tried to kill him a couple times. But David was fleeing for his life. Imagine fleeing for your life when, when God told you you were going to be somebody. But yet everybody else is out to get you. You're being persecuted. Verse 11, more my father sees in the corner of your robe. He's telling Saul there, the king, I cut off a piece of your robe last night. I could have killed you. Verse 12, let the Lord judge you and me. This is the king talking to King David. David let the Lord avenge upon me by my hand shall not be against you. As a proverb of ancient wickedness proceeds from the wicked, but my hand shall not be against you. After whom has the king of Israel come out? Whom do you pursue, a dead dog? Therefore let the Lord be the judge and judge between you and me and see that plead my cause and deliver me out of your hand. So when David had finished speaking these words to Saul, Saul said, Is this the voice of my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. And he said to David, You are more righteous than I, for you have rewarded me with good, whereas I rewarded you with evil. And we all know what happens when you stick to God's plans. God is a rewarder of those who diligently stay focused in other words if you get a word from the lord now let's just say your word here is tonight to trust god with all your heart all your might all your strength and all your being don't lean on your own understanding anymore try not to handle a situation like you used to handle and trust the lord that don't mean not doing anything that means you probably have to increase in prayer probably have to increase in, in your in your work for people yeah you're gonna probably have to you know not only carry uh, no more grudges but bury those grudges and you're going to have to do this number one thing. Can every eye forgive yourself? You'd be surprised how many people have forgiven themselves what they've done in secret. So they always think the devil's always trying to tell you, you get what's coming to you. Because you know you did it. And you know you deserve it. And then we'll go like this. We'll justify ourselves. Well, I ain't as bad as so-and-so. You know what she did? Or he did? And then we justify the means. What about here? Let's go back to our outline. David had many opportunities to avenge himself, but refused to do so. He had a word from God that he would promote him one day. That's Psalm 75, 7. So David had a word from the Lord. How many here get a word from the Lord every once in a while? What I mean, Mr. Read your Bible. Yeah. Yeah. That's a word from the Lord. So God has told you something. You might be going through something right now, or you might be coming out of something. But be careful that you don't allow yourself to be afraid of the future because of something that somebody said. Oh, you just, that's just a big lie. They're not going to do that for you. Or you're going to find yourself right back in that same thing. I'll give you a little bit of time. Or you know that man's no good for you. You're going to let him back in. Come on. And then that's going to bring some fear. The next thing you know, you're going to react if you don't trust God. Sometimes being set free means being ready to fight this one fight. What's that one fight God told us to fight? Fight of faith. See, David had faith when the Lord told him he was going to be king one day. But yet he's out to being persecuted. Somebody's trying to take what he's earned. I said, somebody's trying to take what you've earned. And it's not fair. 
and they'll lie, and they'll backbite, and they'll reject, and they'll say all kinds of terrible things about us to get where we're at or to take what you've got so they can promote themselves. But you know the great thing about the Word of God? It tells you that that could happen. So you're not, it's not a surprise. Are you surprised that you're going through something? You shouldn't be. You think that just because you're born again, you're going to go to heaven one day, and you got these angels around you, and God's just taking you and gracing you, loving on you, and kissing you on you, and talking to you all the time, that everything's going to be great? Well, I'm here to tell you, the truth's going to set you free. It ain't going to happen. Now, you're supposed to tell earth as it is in heaven. Come on now. God promised you peace. That's what he promised us. But guess what? Trials and tribulations will come. But we don't, we don't, we don't focus on that. We, we've been through enough of that. We've had enough grandkids. Come on, Jerry. We've had enough of those. We know how kids react if you had kids. So you're not surprised when something goes wrong. You can say, oh, well, take care of it. Amen? It's the same with the Word of God. God's Word never changes, so you know that, hey, He's the truth. He's going to do what He said, even if it takes a little bit longer this time. But we have to remain patient and stay in the Word and continue to uh, influence ourselves by, by lifting our own selves up sometimes. You know, David, here he was in this time, and, and he, he had to get off by himself and encourage himself in the Lord. I mean, we're on the phone. Oh, baby, do you know what I've You know what I've been through? Oh, baby, I love you. You're looking for somebody to lift us up and cry with us. And then the devil goes, ha, 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 check out everybody. Amen? Yeah. Yeah, no, Let's go to this next thought. As a result of all of God's promises to David came to pass, even in his old age, God showed David mercy, even as David had shown mercy to Saul. So you read what you're sowing. Right now, whatever you're going through right now is probably because those seeds have been sown a while back, whether it's good or evil. <coughs> but thank God we're growing in the grace of God. And this is the victory who overcomes this world of evil, our faith. You're overcoming because you've got great faith. You don't need more faith. You just use the little mustard seed faith you got. And tomorrow, guess what? You get to use it again. Well, you might get a break every once in a while. But not too often. Because you're growing in the things of God in Revelation. Jesus did not come to condemn the world. Jesus did not come to condemn those people. That's the great thing about knowing Jesus. John 3, 17. Everybody knows that one, right? So 16, so God so loved the world that he gave. God gave something to set us free from persecution. He gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What's everlasting life? Believing in Jesus. There it is. You want everlasting life? Believe in Jesus. That's what it says. It's not, it's not if I do all these things in the church right. Those things will come naturally as you believe in Jesus and trust in the Lord, trust in his word. Amen? Verse 17, For well, God so loved, God did not send his son into this world to condemn the world, but that the world through him must be saved, born again, come to a revelation, to get united back to the family of the kingdom of God. 2 Corinthians 5.19 and Jesus is not holding man's sins against them either. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. Look at 18. All these things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ, reconciled the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses against them, and committing to us the word of reconciliation. In other words, God not holding... God's not holding things against people. The Bible says that he was created to be sin for us. So those people who are persecuting you, those people who are hurting you in some way, or you might be doing it to someone else. Knock it off. Jesus died for them too. God's no respecter of a person. 
That's why the hey, it rained pretty good today, didn't it? Well, guess what? There's probably some evil guy on the other side of another town close to us. He got some rain on his crops. Well, he don't deserve that. <laughs> Much grace. Come on. Come on. God shows mercy to everyone. Why does he show mercy to our, to our enemies? To bring them in too. That's who he is. That's his character. Well, it's not fair. God didn't call it fair. Right. Who are we? We're just the clay. He, he's the potter. Right. You ever heard a bowl complain to the, to the person who made him? Hey, you got a little crack in this bowl here, buddy. <laughs> you know, you know, the, you know what that potter probably tell him? I'll put you back on that wheel and squish you and make you, make you into a, a tulip. <laughs> Come on. Let's look at the next thought. We have been given the same ministry of reconciliation. We just talked about that. We're coming down to the end. There are those who do not receive the love we extend to them, but rather take advantage of us. Because of what? Because we turn the other cheek. Because we have mercy. Because we know, too, that they, too, need to know the love of God that we have experienced, even in the midst of our own, come on, evil times. And the last thought down there, in any, how many of us in our worst moments, before we received eternal life, hurt someone else because... We didn't know God. I'm talking about being persecuted. Now, if you're being persecuted for, the, for living a holy life, well, hallelujah. That's one-on-one Christianity. Now comes the learning of getting your mind renewed by the Word of God, treating others better than yourself, speaking good things into people's lives. Love your enemies. Come on. Don't curse them. Don't try to get them back. You know what forgiveness really is? I'm going to end on this. Forgiveness is not just saying, well, Lord, I forgive them. Right. You know, but deep down inside, you know, if you see them again, or the back of your hair would stand up, because <clears throat> you know what they did to you, or you know what they said about you. Forgiveness is really this attitude. If there was a chance that you had to get them back and nobody else was around, man, but you didn't do it, yeah. that's love. God says, that's a reward right there. God bless you spiritually, physically, mentally, and financially. If you need prayer, I'll be up front. Study these things tonight. Or, yeah, get right back in it. Prove the devil's wrong, God's right. Bring somebody with you next week. God bless you.